Today we're in a very important topic because this is the direction that we're planning on going. You know, we introduced a topic a couple weeks ago on um, how we want to build a discipleship-based church here at Southwest Community Church and what that entails. And then we talked about how we need to go there for, right? And last week we talked about the commitment that we all need to make in our lives to live for Christ, to be those true worshipers that just don't stand up and sing, but live out with their life their commitment to follow Jesus Christ. And you see, the reason why we're doing a series on following is because if we want to fill this church and reach people for Christ, if we want to uh, you know, just show others Jesus' love, if we want to reach out to others for Jesus Christ, we all have to make the commitment to follow Jesus in every area of our lives. And so that's why we're doing this series called Follow Me. Today in the series, we're on what's called the call. The Gospel of John often says that after seeing miracles that Jesus was doing, that the crowd that was surrounding him would start to follow him. They would see Jesus, the Messiah, do a a miracle, and they would all start to follow Jesus. But the question has to be asked is, how many, after believing this, after seeing and believing, because that's what it says, they would see a miracle, they would believe, and they would follow, how many of them actually made the commitment to stick it through and fully follow? How many would drop their religious duties... And follow. How many left behind the comfort of home and followed? Or how about this? How many would go against the crowd when the crowd noise would stand up, when people would start mocking Christ? How many would follow even in that moment? How many put their life second and followed Jesus first? Now, these questions can also be aimed at us. You see, the 12 that follow Jesus, that we know follow Jesus, the disciples, their lives were completely transformed because of the commitment, because of the answer to the call to follow Jesus. They went from being just mere fishermen and tax collectors to what Matthew 4.19 just simply puts as fishers of men. They went from fishermen to fishers of men. They answered the call. They went from uneducated, unarticulate men to confident, brazen leaders in their speech in Acts 4.13 where people would say, wait, 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 wait. These are these fishermen. But man, you could tell they've been with Jesus. They went from being something that they used to be. Just regular people. Scared out of their wits when Jesus was put on the cross. To brazen leaders, as we read in Acts 4.29. And it was all because they answered the call in their life and the call that is in every single one of our lives to follow. The same is true today. Jesus wants to transform His believers. He wants to transform people that put their trust in Jesus as their Savior. He wants to change the way we work, the way we act, the way we talk, the way we live. How we interact with other people. How we interact with our wives, our children. How we interact with our friends. He wants to change that. He wants to change how we worship. But in order to do that, we have to answer His call. His call to follow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear precious Heavenly Father, We come to you right now, Lord, and we'd like to thank you for being such a wonderful, awesome, and mighty God. 
Lord, the, the, the call to follow is so true and it rings out into every one of our lives, Lord, but we all have to answer that call. We all have to make the commitment to follow. We all have to answer the call to follow, Lord, because it's true for all of us. Lord, help us to come to you with all we have, all we can give, and answer the call to follow you, no matter what it may cost. We pray this in Jesus' precious and most holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Sorry, I'm still very dehydrated from yesterday. The Apostle Peter is often thought of as the brazen leader of the, of the apostles, right? Most of the time when we think of him, we think of the keys of heaven being given to him as Peter, this rock I will build my kingdom on, and heaven will, will win, hell can't win, and everything's great. That's how we think of Peter. And sometimes we think of him as the guy that put his foot in his mouth quite often. But what we often fail to see is the transformation that took place in Peter's life when he made the decision to follow Jesus. We fail to see that in order for him to become a good leader, he had to first follow Jesus Christ. And what we also forget to see is just like us oftentimes, Peter was actually reluctant to follow Jesus. He was sluggish to make the commitment. He was actually satisfied with the life he had and the answer to call, the call to follow was a little slow. Let's talk a little bit first though about Peter's happy life. Okay, let's, let's think about it in this way. Peter had a very happy life. He was born Simon from the area of Galilee called Bethsaida and we see that in John 1, 44. As we see in, in Matthew 8, 14 and 15, he was married. Okay, it says that he had a mother-in-law. In fact, it says that he had a good relationship with his mother-in-law, or at least we can read into that, because he actually asked Jesus, hey, she's sick, I don't want her to die, can you save her? So we can see that he probably had a good relationship with her, because if he had one of those mother-in-laws that were yappy, he would have been like, oh yeah, everything's good. <laughs> so... I have, I've been blessed with a good mother-in-law, okay? <laughs> I noticed some of you guys are thinking. <laughs> the other thing we know about Peter is that he had a good family business going. He was with his brother working with Andrew. He was with John, and, and he was with, with uh, James, and they, he, they were with his, their father, and they were doing a really good family business going on. Matthew 4, 18 through 20, it shows that. But then in an instant, his little brother Andrew changed his life. Then in an instant, his brother Andrew did something that would completely rattle his life. It's something that each one of us is told we need to do when Andrew brought his brother to Christ. When Andrew introduced his brother to Jesus Christ, Peter's life, or Simon's life at that point, would change. He would be rocked by who he would be introduced to. Open your Bibles, if you will, to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, we see the introduction that Peter receives to Christ. John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 35 to 42. It says, again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, Andrew being one of the disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translates teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the tenth hour. 
I want to point out to you real quick, though, it just says they stayed with him that day. They stayed with him that day. Look, they were excited to follow Jesus. They were excited when John pointed out and said, hey, look, that's the Messiah that we've been promised. John the Baptist says, that's the guy, and they go from following John the Baptist to following Jesus for that day. Let's keep on. Verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. You see, Peter is introduced to the Messiah. His brother, his brother comes up to him and says pretty much, Peter, you got to follow me because we found him, we found the Messiah. You see, people kept coming to Jesus, hearing and seeing what he was doing. They heard of the miracles, and they believed, but their lives would stay unchanged. They would leave the same person, and that happens even today. People put their trust in Jesus. They believe in Jesus as their Savior, which is fantastic because you go from death into life. You have a life of eternity in Him. But they walk away unchanged in their lifestyle. And that was what was taking place here. And that's what takes place in our own lives. A sermon grabs a hold of us and shakes us, and it feels like the the pastor's just pointing at you as he's speaking, and then you say, wow, that really hit me. But you remain the same. You get into the Word and you start reading it, and you say, wow, I need to apply this but you remain the same. You read a devotion and the same thing happens. You see, that's what was taking place in these people's lives. They would get excited, but tomorrow, Monday would roll around. And instead of letting what they had taken in from Christ sink in, they were walking away and not following Jesus Christ with their lives They would walk away and it was kind of back to the grindstone. They would walk away and it was back to the old life. But the good thing is Jesus is persistent in his call to action. In his call to follow. The call to action today needs to be enacted for tomorrow. The call for today, today's sermon needs to be Monday's mission And that's what Jesus wants to see in our lives, and that's what he wanted to see in the lives of the people that were believing in him. But the problem was the call of contentment was loud in their lives and can be loud in our own lives as well. And they would keep on going back home. Take a look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Here again is Jesus' call. Matthew 4, 18. It says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately, they left their boat and their father father, and followed him. Imagine being Zebedee at that moment. (laughs) Again, Jesus calls to follow. He calls the action of their life. Get up and stop being content and follow me. You see, the, the excitement is so tangible. The fact that these guys would get out of their boats, get out of their livelihood, and follow Jesus. 
But the excitement of following was quickly swallowed up by the everyday life once again. The commitment to follow was swallowed up by everyday life, by everyday commitment. You see, what we fail to see is that Jesus wants to fo- us to follow Him in every aspect of our life, in every area of our life, to fully commit to Him in every area that we have, whether it be our speech, whether it be at home, at work, with our children, no matter where it is, with our finances. He wants us to follow Him in every single area. And these guys would follow for the day and keep on going back to what they knew. Then came the final call, the realization of the life that Jesus really wants us and wanted Peter to live. It was a life of obedience as children. It was a life of of spirit-led walk and relationship. Not religious duty, but relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's where we're going to look at Luke chapter 5. I know we're jumping around a lot today, but it's very important. Luke chapter 5. Verses 1 through 11. It says, now it happened. Now, I guess you could say, now it finally happened. (laughs) That while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw the two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put it a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said to him, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I'll do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. They began to bust. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken in. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought in their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. Do you kind of catch what's going on here? The men were exhausted from a very long day's work. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, this was their livelihood. This is what they knew. This is what they grew up doing with their fathers. They had spent all day fishing with no results. And here comes Jesus, the known carpenter. People knew him as the carpenter. And he gets in their boat. He says, Peter, let's go out. He finishes speaking. And then he says, Peter, go ahead and drop your nets. We're going to have a catch. Peter's going, whoa, whoa. I don't tell you how to make wood. Don't tell me how to fish. Okay, fine. You kind of sense a little bit of humoring in this, right? He's pandering in a little bit of the speech here. He says, We've caught nothing, Jesus, but okay. We've caught nothing. We've spent the entire day. We're exhausted, but okay. So they go ahead and they lay down their nets, and it says that they come up with such a great catch of fish, they look over at the shore and they say, you guys got to come in here and help us. They fill both of the boats to the point of sinking. 
And this time, Peter finally understands. It was such a great catch of fish ready for market. With the abundance of life financially that he could have had at that moment. I mean, Peter is staring in the face probably the biggest payday he had ever had in his life. It said that the boats were filled to the point of sinking. This was his livelihood. He had never caught that much fish. It was such a miracle he started worshiping Jesus right then. And so did the other guys. I mean, you got to think about this. And Jesus says, Peter, you need to stop. Don't even think about that. And follow me. Peter, I know you're staring the face into probably a year's worth of wages right here in one catch, but you need to follow me. Peter, you have a decision to make. Follow me. Either become rich financially or rich spiritually in me. You're at the height of your contentment in this very moment. You have your house, you have your job, you have your wife, you have everything you need, and right here you're staring at the biggest payday you could ever have, Peter. And now is the true moment of decision. I don't want you to go back home anymore. I don't want you to walk away the same person. I want you to change at this very moment and follow me, Peter. That's the decision he was staring in the face. I liked Wesley's commentary on this very same thing. Wesley says they forsook all and they followed him. They forsook all, they rejected all, they put all the rest down and they followed him. It does say though, he says they had followed him before. But not to the point of forsaking all. Not to the point of a total rejection. Till now, they wrought at their own ordinary calling. They worked hard, it should say, or it could say, at life. But Jesus doesn't just want us to work hard at life. He wants us to work hard at following him and doing everything, whether we're a pig farmer from Georgia Or we're the guy waiting tables and flipping burgers. He wants us to work our hardest for his glory. And that's what it means to follow. The call to follow is for all. We're all called to follow. Though not all are called to be pastors, not all are called to be missionaries, we are all called to follow Jesus Christ with our life. Amen? Amen. You're called to follow at all times. You don't separate it and say, well, I'm at work, so this is my time, this is work mode. No, at work you're called to follow Jesus. When you're at home, it's not, okay, it's, it's, I'm, I'm in daddy mode. No, at, wor- at home you are called to be a, a father for Christ or to be a husband for Christ. You see, in every single area of your life, you're called to follow Him and live for Him. Even with the little broken pieces that we are and that we have, we're to lay them down before the throne of Christ and say, you make the best of this that you can. That's what Jesus wants from us. That's the call to follow. You know, a lot of times I realize that we don't feel adequate to follow Christ. We look at the things that we've done, we look at the mistakes in our past, and we say, I don't know if Jesus really wants to use this, or if he can. But Jesus uses you if you're willing to follow, despite you. I read a very neat story once. It was by... um, when John Wesley was doing his uh, evangelistic revivals, he went around and he would do these speeches and he would go and he would share the gospel with big groups 
and people would come to Christ, but what he would do is he would ask other pastors from the, the area to come in uh, so he could plug them into churches because he realized that if he just reached people for Christ and left them as babies, that the excitement would fade away. So he would have other pastors come and speak with him. And so one night, uh, they, they were preaching, and they were in a rural area, so they had a, a good surrounding. There was a, a bunch of you know, pastors from the wealthy areas, but also pastors from the not-so-wealthy areas. And this night, he had a pastor get up from a farming village that was close by. And his passage was going to be on Luke 19.21, talking about the talents and the servants. And the pastor got up and he read, Lord, I feared thee. He was reading from the, New King, the King James. Lord, I feared thee because thou art an austere man. And you see, the guy wasn't very educated. He didn't get a chance to get formal education. He really had no seminary training or Bible training. He had no clue what the word austere meant. In fact, he had read it incorrectly to the, to the point where he spoke of Jesus being an oyster man. He said, Lord, I feared you because you were an oyster man. People, the pastors that were surrounding looked and they were getting a little upset, and Wesley saw that in their face. But they, the pastor went on and he explained how a diver must grope in the dark in the freezing water, and he's, he's looking for these oysters as he's diving down. And in, in, in his attempt, he's cutting his hands open on the jagged rocks and on the oysters themselves, and his hands become to, to, to bleed, and he pulls these oysters up to the brightness of the sun, into the light of day with these bleeding hands, just as Christ descended on earth, descended upon earth, dug down and, and raised us oysters, I guess, <laughs> into the light of him with his torn, bleeding hands. Because that was the sight of the value he put on us. Just like these divers put the value on the oyster. Well, after he finished giving this little sermonette, he went ahead and he, he said, and how many of you want to put your trust in this oyster man that raises you up to the light of day? And they said there were so many hands. There was just, you know, dozens of, of people trusting Christ. And after it was all done, these pastors, they came up to Wesley and they said, how could you? Let this guy get up there who had no education, no training, and was just too ignorant to even understand this simple passage. Because let's be honest, he did take it out of context. <laughs> he said, how could you let him get up there and do this? And Wesley, who was an Oxford-educated man, said, let's never mind that. Because the Lord got dozens of oysters today. You see, the, the call to follow is on us. We're called to follow with what shortcomings we have, with whatever mistakes we've made in our life and make use of them for Jesus Christ. To use that to His advantage, to the glory of Him. And let Him work in us. Jesus called the tax collector, the fisherman. He called men that were uneducated and really uninspiring. But the work he did through them, the work he did through them has rocked this world to its core and just continues to happen day after day. Fishermen. But fishermen who answered the call to follow. Fisherman who said, I'm giving you my life, Lord. Use it in any way possible. Let's keep on looking in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 9. 
And hold your place there because we're going to keep on going through. In Luke 9.23, it says, And Jesus said, was saying to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. You see, following means taking someone's guidance, doesn't it? That's literally what following means. It means that you're following someone else, you're you're taking somebody's guidance, you're accepting it, and, and you're not resisting it. And that's what is being talked about here. You're taking that instruction. You're taking that guidance. Look, if it really depended on it, if if our if our physical lives depended on it, we would follow footprint by footprint with whatever Jesus said, wouldn't we? I mean, it's kind of like where those people that go into the Himalayas and the little itty-bitty Sherpas are their guides. And these guys, they have no type of education. If you've seen these guys, a lot of them have about three teeth in their face. And, and they have, they're these itty-bitty little guys. And these, you know, rich, I mean, come on, if you're going scaling the Himalayas, you're pretty rich, you're pretty well off. These rich guys that, you know, have these Harvard educations, they're following these little itty-bitty men. And these little Sherpas, they turn around, they say, we rest here. And they say, okay, we're rest here. Okay? And they set up base camp. And the little Sherpas say, okay, we keep moving. And they move up to the next level. And the Sherpa says, you follow every footprint that I do, that I leave in the snow. Why? Because they know the area. They've been there their entire lives. They've experienced it all. They know that there's hidden cracks beneath the ground that you could fall to. Why do they do that? Because they know that their very lives are dependent on these little men and that they have to follow them. And the God of the universe is calling us to follow him. And our spiritual life is there. And he's seeing the the hidden cracks that could come up in our life. And we're saying, no, Jesus, I'm going to keep on going this way, this route. But he's saying, follow me with every area of your life, with every part of your being. Follow me. So let's do it. You see, it's a total commitment. No hesitations or excuses. If the guy that's scaling the Himalayas, he says, no, you know what? I got a good another day ahead of me of hiking. I'm going to keep on going up that mountain. He'll end up probably not adjusting to the oxygen and immediately falling to his death or severe pain from the pressure that's going to build up in his lungs and the clots. And Jesus is saying, follow me, follow every footprint, follow every path that I take, listen to my guidance and my instruction. Take a look at verses 57 to 58. Here we see the call of two men in their lives with Christ. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. He's pretty much giving him a warning. He's saying, listen, I understand you're excited to follow me, but i got to warn you. It's rough. You're going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be a lot of challenges ahead. There's going to be bumps in the road. You see, two of the people following from the crowd being listed here, two of these people are are saying, I want to follow you. They're trying to make the commitment to follow. There's, Like I said, there's people that would go around wherever Jesus went. In Matthew 8.19, it says that he's a scribe, actually. It says he's a keeper of the law. And he looks at Jesus, he tells him, he says, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. You have the answers. I believe this. I'm committed. Let's go. Jesus gives them that warning. It's going to be tough. Because you have to go without. You may have to reject things that are hard to reject. Take a look at verses 59 to 60. It says, and he said to another, follow me. So the first guy comes up to Jesus, says, I'm going to follow you. The second guy, he's just walking alongside Jesus with the crowd, and he, Jesus looks at him, he says, I want you to follow me. 
But he said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus says to him, verse 60, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. And as far for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Let's take a look at the second guy real quick as we looked at the first guy. Jesus calls him to follow. The first guy says, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. The second guy, he, Jesus has to call. He has to go ahead and beckon. And his answer when Jesus says, follow me, he says, well, Jesus, give me a second to go bury my father. Now, a lot of people really, uh, let's just explain this, they get confused. They start looking at this and they say, wow, Jesus was being really rough with him. The guy's dad is dead and, and Jesus is saying, let the dead bury the dead. But that's not the case here. We take a look at it, and it actually implies that, that the guy's dad hadn't really died yet. In fact, there's a teaching in Talbot that, that you are actually supposed to stay with your parent to make sure they get the proper burial, that everything takes place, and that, and that everything is just kosher for dad. Okay, You're, That's part of you honoring your parents. And you see, that's what's taking place here. In fact, to Ellicott, he says, in the east, the burial followed so immediately on the death of the parent or the, f- the person that died that you, you can pretty much see from within the passage that this isn't the case here. You can see within the passage that the parent had not actually died yet because back then they would immediately bury. What this guy was saying was, Lord... Give me a chance to get my inheritance. What a good kid, right? We can see the guy's dad hadn't even died yet. Jesus saw no need for, for, for this to take place. He's saying, okay, no, I'm calling you to follow me. I'm calling you to drop all and follow. No preparations need to be made. And then he looks over back at the second guy. He said, you know what? You seem ready. You go and you proclaim. You understand what it's going to take. You can follow me spiritually. You don't need to follow me physically at this point. You see, looking at at this, we can see what it takes to follow Jesus. It takes a paradox in our own lives. In men's fraternity, they teach the paradox principle, and it's so true. We have a paradox facing us right here, and it's facing us every single day, and Jesus is calling us to live a paradox. It's something so out there that it actually could be true and can happen. And our paradox that we're faced with here is that we have to die to live in Christ. We have to die to ourself to come alive in Jesus. In Luke 9.62, Jesus says, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You see, what we're being told here is that we have to stay cross-eyed. Not cross-eyed. Everybody's starting to cross their eyes saying, Well, i got to follow. No, we have to stay focused on Jesus Christ. We have to stay focused on our pattern set by Him. Just as you would follow the little Sherpa up the Himalayas. A follower needs to look straight ahead at Christ and the path that he set for us. The cross was a sign of death to people in those times. The cross was a sign of shame. But for us, it needs to be the sign of hope. The sign of a life dedicated to him. Listen, I realize it's going to take effort. That's why it says we have to take up the cross daily, meaning we have to die to ourselves every single day to do this. There's going to be pain and there's going to be struggle. There's going to be times that we just fail. There's going to be times we're so exhausted that we don't want to follow anymore. But let me tell you this, anything worth doing, anything worth doing takes effort. That's why it's worth doing. 
And our relationship with Christ is the same way. It takes effort. The call to believers today is quite simple because it's the same as was back then. It was the same one that he used for Peter. It was the same one he used for John. It was the same one he used for Paul. Live your life as a paradox. Die to yourself. Die to yourself and become alive for Jesus Christ. Take him into every area of your life. Take him into your work. When you work, don't work just for yourself. Work for Jesus Christ. When you're at home, don't just live another day. Live for Him. Be the best father you can be. Not just a good enough one. Be the best employee you can be. Be the best at all you can because you're following Jesus Christ. Because you're living for Jesus Christ. Because by you doing this, you are giving Him and bringing Him glory. Because by doing this, you're growing in your relationship with Him. Because by doing this, you're being a vessel, being willing to be used by Him. He's going to use your faults. He's going to use your failures. He's going to use your successes. He's going to use every experience in your past, present, and future to mold you into the follower that He wants you to be to mold you into the person that he wants to use to bring himself glory. But let me tell you this, brothers and sisters. You have to answer his call to follow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Dear precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for being such a wonderful and awesome God. Lord, you are calling us to reject ourself. To die to ourself so we come alive in you. Die to our selfishness, Lord, and come alive to you. Die to our quietness and speak up for you. Lord, you're asking us to come alive in our relationship, to become a follower, to start living out what we've been taking in. Lord, I pray that that would be on the hearts of every individual here. Lord, that every day as we wake up, we would approach it as, Lord, this is your day, and I will live it for you. And Lord, on those days that we fail, we take it a day at a time, as you say, and we say, Lord, tomorrow. And when we wake up, we say, Lord, this is your day. I'm giving it to you again. Help me not fail in the way I did yesterday. Lord, that we...